Hi guys, welcome to your lecture on Darwin and natural selection. This is the first lecture in our evolution unit. Evolution is a scientific theory, but first we need to discuss what a theory is in science. It is not just um, a guess like it may be in some other subjects. Theories in science are very, very well supported with tons of uh, evidence and they explain uh, how phenomena occur or have occurred in the natural world. And so when we talk about a theory in science, it is extremely well supported uh, and it is very, very difficult to become a scientific theory. Gravity is also a scientific theory. And Charles Darwin was the scientist that we um, credit with the formation of the theory of evolution. And he was alive in the 1800s from 1809 to 1882. And for five years of his life in the 1830s, he sailed around the globe, uh, most notably right here in the Galapagos Islands. He stopped and did a lot of studying on those islands. What did he learn? Um, First, it was the 1800s, and we didn't know a lot about the globe then because there wasn't a lot of world travel. So um, the only things you really knew about were the things right in your immediate area. So if you lived, say, um, here in Virginia with us, then you're only going to know about our local uh, animals. You'll know about deer. You might know about black bears, raccoons, uh, squirrels, stuff like that but you wouldn't know about any of the diversity that is in um, Northern climates like uh, you know Canada or the Arctic, and you wouldn't know about anything that was in tropical climates um, like the rainforest. So he discovered first that the diversity of life or living species was far greater than anybody had previously known. And he did a lot of collecting of specimens, birds and insects, um, he collected lots and lots and lots of organisms. Galapagos Islands um, had tons of diversity, tons of animals. Uh, one of the things that he studied on there were the finches. Uh, and there were different varieties of finch and different variety of tortoises on every island. Each island was unique um, from all of the other islands. Here are some pictures of some of the different uh, tortoises on the Galapagos Islands, they're really huge. In the 1800s, when Darwin was coming up, when he was developing his theory of evolution, at the time, religion stated that the earth was uh, only around 6,000 years old. But scientists, namely a scientist named Lyell, argued that the earth was actually million years many millions of years old because the layers of rock take a lot of time to form. And he was also arguing that processes such as volcanoes and earthquakes shape the earth and still occur today. This is a picture of different rock um, strata and the layers are going to be oldest on the bottom where you see the Cambrian strata and the newer layers will be on top. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was another scientist at the time, and he had developed a theory of acquired characteristics. Basically, if you look at the picture of the giraffe here, he said that organisms uh, acquired new traits by using their bodies in different ways, and then those things were passed on to the offspring. And we know now that that is not true at all. Lamarck was wrong. So basically what he was saying is, if you were to stretch your neck, um, then, and then your child would be born with a longer neck. And if they stretched their neck, then their children would be born with longer necks. And eventually we'd have like just really long necks. Um, but if you acquire a characteristic throughout your life, um, say you get a tattoo or you lose a limb or, um, you have some sort of scar or something like that, that is something that you acquired during your life and that's not genetic, that's not written in your DNA and your children won't be born 
inheriting those traits. Those traits are not heritable. So the theory of acquired characteristics by Lamarck was wrong. Thomas Malthus was a scientist that was saying that if the human population continued to grow unchecked, sooner or later there would be insufficient living space and food for everyone. And that is something that all will need to think about in your lifetime. Currently, we have over 7 billion people on the planet and human population is growing currently exponentially. Darwin wrote the book, The Origin of Species, um, and published it in 1859. He had it written for a long time before that. Like he said, he was doing his voyage around the globe in the 30s. So he was just writing this and he was sitting on it um, because, because he was scared. He was scared of the church's reactions. He um, didn't know, he knew that there was going to be a lot of controversy surrounding um, his ideas and his findings. And he was scared to publish. What made him finally decide to publish is that he met a, another scientist called Alfred Wallace. And Alfred Wallace was developing the same theory as Darwin's and was going to publish his findings. And Darwin was like, wait, no, 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 no. I want to get credit for this because in science, a lot of times, um, you know, it's, it's winner take all. It's the, the first person that comes up with that publishes is the one that gets the credit. Almost everyone knows the name of Darwin. How many people know who Alfred Wallace is? Not many. So Darwin already had his book written and he went ahead and published it before Alfred Wallace could um, get his published. Theory of natural selection um, is what he is most known for. And it has a couple different components to it that are very important. First, organisms differ and variation is inherited. That just means that when you look around, things look different from each other. We can see that uh, just in the classroom looking at each other. We are all different um, and we know that variation is inherited too uh, through looking, you know, just within our, our families. We can see certain characteristics or traits that we inherited. Um, from one of our parents or that we will pass down to our children or offspring. You can also see that with dogs and birds and every other species. The second is that organisms produce more offspring than survive. Um, and unfortunately, that is, that is true. Not all offspring that are born live. That is still true with humans, but not as true as it is with every other species due to the medical advancements that we have made. Um, organisms compete for resources, resources being um, space to live, food, water, anything that they would need for survival uh, be considered a resource. Organisms with advantages survive to pass those advantages to their children survival, that's what we call survival of the fittest. So what they mean by advantages is if you have some sort of characteristic that makes you more likely to be able to survive to the age where you're able to reproduce and then you do reproduce, um, then that adaptation is going to be more likely to be passed on to your offspring, um, assuming that that is genetic. One example of that would be camouflage. If you are able to hide better from your predators uh, and go unnoticed, then you are more likely to survive to pass that on to your children. Um, another advantage might be something like, um, you know, speed or agility or um, intelligence or being poisonous or venomous. There are a lot of different uh types of advantages that could possibly be passed on, but anything that makes you more likely to be able to survive to reproduce increases your fitness. And then the fifth is that species alive today are descended 
with modifications from common ancestors. Here's a picture showing you a lot of different variation in organisms. Point one of Darwin's theory was that organisms differ and variation is inherited. Is that going to be something that is observed, a theory, or a hypothesis? That is actually observed. See that every day right now. Here's a picture of some baby sea turtles. Point number two was that organisms produce more offspring than survive is also something that is observed every day. Picture of a coral reef and it says organisms compete for resources and that would be something that is observed every day and humans do it also. Point four this is a picture of the finches from the Galapagos Islands, the differing finches. That is a picture of a boa eating a deer or an antelope. Organisms with advantages survive to pass those advantages to their children. Again, that point is observed. We can see that. Um, and we can also, we have also been able to manipulate that scientifically. And through, instead of natural selection, we can do that through artificial selections, kind of how we have created all the different breeds and varieties of dogs that are around. Point five, this is a cladogram of humans. We are, we've already spoken about cladograms. Um, and so here are humans, and this would be the extinct common ancestor of chimpanzees, um, including bonobos and humans. And this would be where bonobos and chimpanzees broke off. And then a common ancestor farther back that link us with uh, gorillas or orangutans even farther ago. We've already discussed and shown some of the, um, the skulls of Homo habilis, Homo neanderthalans, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Australopithecus uh, afarensis we have seen all of these different um, skulls in class during our classification unit already. And so this just kind of shows the evolution of humans. And the fifth point of Darwin's theory was that species alive today are descended with modifications, um, meaning that there's changes from common ancestors. That is a theory. We cannot observe that in real time because we're talking about stuff that occurred millions and millions of years ago. We can see evidence of it in our DNA. We can see evidence of it in the fossils um, that we discover. And we can put together a lot of information that is all pointing in the same direction and learn much about it. Um, but that's never something that we're going to be able to observe within our lifetime.